Uh, let us start. <clears throat> First, uh, uh, I forgot to mention last time, I will always use the metric convention for Minkowski space time to be, uh, to be given by this one. So the time component have minus one, and then the spatial component is positive one. And uh, yeah, so, so also let me just first remind you what we did in last lecture. So um, in last lecture, we talked about principle of locality, which is a powerful principle. And uh, so this naturally leads to the concept of fields. And so I will generally denote fields, say using this kind of notation. Yeah, in the, uh, 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 when we talk about fields abstractly, we will use this kind of location. And uh, so phi just, and A just label for, uh, for different fields. And also, so the fields depend on spatial coordinate and also depend on time. So the physically, you can think of this spatial dependence as the label for the, uh, uh, for the fields, uh, uh, for the degree of freedom. So at each spatial point, there's a degree of freedom and the time uh, uh, describe its evolution, okay. So essentially this is like, so, so classical field is like classical mechanics, degree freedom, but now with the infinite number degree freedom, okay. So the, so the classical field theory is like a classical mechanics, but now with infinite number of degree freedom. Because now you have, some finite number degrees freedom for uh, for each point in space time. Okay. And the principle locality also implies that the action for such kind of dynamical variables, so the fields are our dynamical variables, and also implies that the action has a very uh, uh, has a local form. So that the action have the form that is always a single space-time integral and uh, uh, some function which is called Lagrangian density, which is a function of the field, say phi at some point, uh, at the point x, which, and then all, also its derivatives. Okay. And uh, so uh, because of locality, then the action uh, 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 has a very simple form. Okay, and then you can, uh, as in classical mechanics, you can introduce canonical momentum, conjugate to your dynamical variable. So, so we have uh, um, momentum density, say conjugate to phi a at each point. Okay. So, so this is the phi dot, which is the time derivative of phi. And then you can also introduce the Hamiltonian uh, density, which is the pi a phi dot a. So a is summed and the minus l. Okay, and the Hamiltonian is obtained by integrating this over space. Uh, uh, yeah. And also the equation motion, when you do the variation of the action, and you find the equation motion is given by the, the following general form. Okay, so the equation motion is given by this general form. And when we study field theory, as we study, say, any other subject, we always start with simplest examples, okay? And the simplest example would be, say, a single, a single scalar field, okay, if you can see the single scalar field. Which you have low index, we just have five, you not depend on space time point x. And then the simplest action for such a scalar field, you can just write down based on uh, uh, a general principle, say, um, yeah, so, uh, so you can have this form. So we discussed last time the simplest action for scalar field have the following form. 
I show mu phi, phi show mu phi, and the plus m square, phi square. And the sign here is determined because of the metric convention. Okay. So this is the simplest, say, scalar field theory we can write down. Okay, so here I have written here a quadratic uh, 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 function for phi, which we wrote as a general function last time. And here it's from uh, uh, here the kinetic term comes from the Lorentz symmetry. So this is the simplest derivative term you can write down, uh, which uh, respect Lorentz symmetry. You can have more complicated terms. You can have this term, for example, square. Okay, but that will be more complicated. So, uh, so this is the simplest one. Okay. And uh, so this will be the simplest field theory we will we will study first. Okay, and uh, um, so in this case, for uh, for this example, the uh, 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 the the momentum density just you could divide dot this time derivative of phi, and then the equation motion is given by a linear equation phi is given by that. So this is a very simple theory. It's very simple equation motion. And uh, but later we will see. Actually, will uh, teach us a lot about general field theory. So so that's a, it's a very quick summary of some of the main points of last lecture. Do you have any questions? Yes. Right, uh, 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 so phi here is a real field, yeah. Yeah, so, so phi just take a real value, yeah. Other questions? Good, okay. So now we um, talk about the second topic related to our Discussion of classical field theory and symmetries. Conservation rules. So when we have a theory, say with such an action, we say the theory has a symmetry. So the definition of the symmetry is the following. So symmetry is some transformation of each field phi a into, say, some function of phi. So uh, so this uh, uh, this new phi a can uh, uh, can say uh, uh, depend on. Uh, 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 all possible fields, okay? And so some transformation of your dynamical variables. So here prime is just a, it means a different function, does not mean derivatives, okay? Which leaves the action invariant. Okay? So, so whenever happens, and uh, um, we say this is a symmetry. So, um, so for example, in this, in this example, okay, in this example, uh, uh, um, yeah. let me give you a label, label to this equation. Let me call this equation star. So, in the uh, uh, so in the um, in the example of star, say for example, the symmetry includes, say, translation. Okay, so so if you imagine, we take a coordinate transformation, uh, uh, we do a shift in coordinates. By a constant shift. Okay, let's imagine we do a constant shift of the coordinates. 
and a mu is a constant. So a mu are constant. Okay, uh, uh, so it's a constant vector. And now if we assume that the phi transform as a falling, so when you change the coordinates, it essentially just change the label, okay, uh, uh, change the label uh, uh, on the field. So, but the value of the field should not change. So that means that the phi evaluated at the original point should be the same. So that means the new transformed phi evaluated at the new point, okay, a new x prime point should be the same as the value at the original point. Okay, so this is the, uh, uh, um, yeah, so, so suppose the phi transform like this, so the so scalar field should transform as this under a general so this is the example of a space-time transformation, okay, uh, and the general space-time transformation. As say this equation, okay. So the uh, uh, so you change the label, but the value of phi should not change, okay. So uh, so the new phi evaluated at the new location should be the same as the value of phi uh, at the original location, okay? And so you can easily check yourself, okay? So you can easily check yourself, I will not do it here. So, so this exercise for yourself, that actually this action is invariant under this transformation, uh, it's invariant under this transformation with this, uh, 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 with this change of x, okay? Any questions on this? So second transformation, which this is invariant, is a Lorentz uh, symmetry. So Lorentz transformation is another kind of space-time transformation on the space-time coordinates. Is you take x mu to x mu prime, you go to lambda mu nu, x nu. So 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 lambda mu nu is the constant Lorentz transformation matrix, okay? Okay, the constant Lorentz transformation matrix. And again, under such a coordinate transformation, phi will, uh, will transform this way. Phi should transform this way. And now you, uh, and now you can check yourself, okay? And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, because of this contraction of partial mu, partial mu, and this is actually a symmetry. Okay, again, this is left as an exercise for yourself. And in fact, I think uh, uh, in your PSAT problem, you will do something similar. Okay. Any questions on this? Good. So um, examples like this kind of transformation for translation and for Lorentz transformation, so this is what we call the uh, continuous symmetries. So, uh, so continuous symmetries Okay, so, so these are the transformations I should also give a label to this equation. So let me call it just star, star, star. So, <laughs> so uh, uh, continuous symmetries are transformations like star, star, star involving continuous parameters. Okay, and uh, so both one and two are um, and the two are clearly uh, uh, continuous symmetries. 
yeah, they are continuous symmetries. So you can easily see from here. So here the transformation is uh, A, and A is four numbers. Okay, it's a vector, it's a four vector. And A can be arbitrarily changed. So it's a continuous parameter, okay? You can take it to be zero, you can take it to be 0 0.1 in all directions, etc. So you can, it's, it's something that can be continuous changed. And similarly, the load range transformation uh, uh, contains continuous parameters. So do you remember how many continuous parameters does the Lorentz transformation contain in four dimensions? Yes. Hmm? No. <laughs> yes? Yeah, six. Uh, it's because you have three rotations, because you have three directions, uh, three spatial directions, you have three rotations, and then you also have three boosts. Yeah, so altogether six. So here there's six continuous parameters. And here there's a four. Okay, so here there's four. So both are continuous symmetries, okay? And in contrast, this Lagrangian have a, uh, this action has a lot of symmetry, uh, which is not continuous. Can you say what that symmetry is? Good. Uh, Parity is a good. Uh, it's a. It's a good. Uh, 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 it's a good answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, but there's still uh, uh, something slightly simpler. Yeah. So so notice that here it's all quadratic in phi. And uh, and what do you observe? So, so here there is a symmetry, a lot of symmetry. It's phi goes to minus phi, okay, because it's quadratic in phi. And also, of course, there's a symmetry called the parity, which in the case x goes to minus x. So the spatial direction x goes to minus x, and then phi again transforms as this, okay. And then you can also check this is also symmetry. So in both of these cases, they don't involve continuous parameters, and so these are called discrete symmetries. Okay, so there's no continuous parameters, and uh, 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 yeah. In this case, both of them are called Z2. In this, uh, Z2 means that if you do the transformation once, they go back to the identity. Okay, so here if you do the uh, uh, twice, uh, yeah, if you do it twice, go back to it. Then if you do it twice, go back to it. Then I think this is the same. So here is a Z2 transformation. Also, symmetries can be also separated into, say symmetries can be separated into continuous symmetry or discrete symmetries, depend on whether you have continuous parameters or not. But symmetries can also be separated into other different, uh, uh, there's a lot of classification of the symmetry. It's called the uh, 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 gauge symmetry and the global symmetries. So they are global symmetries. Corresponding to the transformation parameters are space-time independent. Okay, so both of these are examples uh, 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 of global symmetries because because they are just constant. Okay, they don't de uh, you don't depend on space time, and the lambda don't depend on space time. Okay, and uh, you can also have local symmetries. Which, uh, in which case, the transformation parameters, the transformation parameters, are space-time dependent. Okay. So 
So, so example of the local transformation, which you may remember, is the uh, so-called gauge transformation in E and M. So E and M, you can, uh, um, yeah, anyway. Uh, so later we will see example. Uh, we will go back to E and M again, and you will see examples of this local image. Any questions? Yes? Changes the action, but doesn't change the equations of motion. Is that the symmetry? Uh, yeah, yeah, as far as it is the action, uh, uh, yeah, that's a very good question. So, so uh, uh, by definition, uh, uh, if it's leave the action invariant, we say it's a symmetry. And in general, actually, almost always, if it leaves the action invariant, actually also leaves the equation motion environment. Yeah, but it's not guaranteed. Yeah, yes, purely from mathematical point of view, it's not guaranteed. But for all physical examples, uh, it's almost always the same. Other questions? Okay, good. And now, there's a very simple, and it's simple, but a, but a very deep connection between the symmetry and the conservation nodes, so that may uh, you may have already landed in in yeah actually I forgot uh, when I landed myself. So some of them uh, some of you may land in high school, some of you may land in eight or one etc. Anyway, so so there's a, a connection between the symmetry and the conservation nodes, and uh, so any conservation nodes can be understood as a, a consequence of symmetry. So in classical mechanics, you may remember that the time translation this leads to energy conservation. And the, uh, the spatial translation symmetry then leads to the momentum conservation. And if it's a rotational symmetry, then this to the angular momentum conservation. Okay. So so this is, should be something you already know, say from your uh, say from your classical mechanics. But in classical field theory, this can be uh, generalized. Okay, so so here, there's a Lothar theorem. So first uh, discovered by Amy Lothar, the Lothar theorem. He said any continuous global symmetry These two conservation laws, okay. Okay, these two conservation laws. And uh, so, no matter what kind of symmetry, okay, uh, uh, no matter, uh, in addition to those things you are familiar with, but no matter what kind of symmetry, but anytime you have a continuous global symmetry uh, 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 in your system, then you have conserved uh, your conservation law. Okay, so now let me give a proof of this Noether theorem. Okay, so before I prove it, do you have any questions regarding its statement? Yes? Uh, what's like the, like the definition? So you said like the continuous symmetry is only on a continuous scale on a, on a parameter, but if you wanted to write out like equation star, star, star in a way that specializes the continuous symmetry, is there a way to do that? Uh, to show like, just like how to check something is a continuous. Oh yeah, yeah. You just check whether there's a continuous parameter. You just check whether there's a parameter or not. Yeah. Does this answer your question? Yeah. 
normally you can just see whether there's a parameter. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, if you write down the transformation explicitly, you will be able to just see. If for example, here there's no transformation parameter. You can just see, and there, uh, uh, for the Lorentz transformation and translation, you can just see it explicitly. Okay. So, so important aspect of a continuous symmetry is that because you have a continuous parameter, so you can uh, a continuously related to identity. So, so the trivial transformation, you just you don't transform at all, right? So, so in this case, the mu is equal to zero, and so in this case, the trivial transformation, just the lambda mu mu, is the identity matrix. And then you can imagine a slightly uh, 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 turning on a slight uh, infinitesimal rotation or infinitesimal boost. And then that's corresponding to a, a so-called infinitesimal transformation. Okay. So here you can also just translate a mu a little bit. Okay. So very close to the identity. And so, so, so essentially for any, okay, so for any global uh, continuous symmetry, It has an infinitesimal form. Okay, it's just when the parameter, when your transform uh, uh, transformation parameter is very close to the identity. Okay, very close to the zero. And so, so for example, uh, for general transformation like this. If the transformation is close to the identity, then we can always write it in the following form. Phi A goes to phi A prime, which is equal to phi A, and with some parameter, small parameter epsilon, and some function F A, and then say phi B, okay, and the derivative of phi B, et cetera. Okay, so this epsilon, is the infinitesimal transformation parameter. Okay, so if you have a, a continuous symmetry, there's always, say, an infinitesimal transformation, which are close to the identity. So, uh, uh, so this epsilon corresponding to this case would be for a mu is very small, or for the uh, uh, Lorentz transformation case corresponding to rotation angle is very small, or the boost is very small. Okay. Yeah, so the epsilon can be any of those parameters. And then this f, it can be some arbitrary function, okay? So this f can be some arbitrary functions of your field. Okay. Good. So, so in this case, yeah, uh, so in this case, the delta phi, okay, so the, um, yeah, so the symmetry transformation, uh, so we'll use the rotation, delta hat phi a, so this symmetry goes, uh, then given by the epsilon f a, okay? So, so, so delta hat here uh, implies a symmetry transform, uh, 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 infinitesimal symmetry transformation. So now let's consider during a variation of S under this theta hat, okay? Since the, by definition of the symmetry, because of the, uh, the, this is a symmetry, that means the delta, delta hat S should be equal to zero, okay? Because of the variation of the action should be invariant under the, uh, uh, the symmetry. And so now let's look at what's the consequence of it. Okay. So, so now we can just worry this L. Then the, so this means that the variation of the L, uh, Lagrangian density, must be a total derivative. Okay, since all, the, every transformation is proportional to abs yeah, uh, 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 so epsilon is a, pr a small parameter. So when we do the transformation, we only need to keep keep track of linear order in the in, uh, uh, in epsilon. 
So, so the transformation of the uh, L so, so must also be proportional to epsilon. Okay, so so uh, so since the, uh, uh, this must be invariant, that means the variation of the L must be a total derivative. So k-mu would be just some. So for some k-mu, okay, for some k-mu. So there must exist some k-mu, and this k-mu can also be zero. Uh, the, uh, uh, in that case, the Lagrangian density is invariant. Yes. Sorry? Is delta hat the variation under the transformation? Delta hat is a delta hat just denotes such a transformation. Just denotes such a, a transformation. Uh, uh, this is not the general trans. This is not the general variation. This is a very specific. This is a symmetric transformation. Yeah. And uh, so under the symmetric transformation, your action should be invariant by definition because this is a symmetry, and that in turn. Be because the S is the uh, integration of L, then that means that the transformation of L, uh, the Langone density, must be a total derivative. And uh, here we are only uh, only keep track of everything linear order in epsilon, and so this must be proportional to epsilon uh, times the total derivative. Okay, and so uh, so you uh, we must have this structure. Yeah, for some for some case. Okay, which can be zero. Which can be zero. Okay. Good. So now let's look at what's the implications of this equation. Okay. So this equation is the constraint imposed by the symmetry. Okay. Now let's look at what the implications of this constraint. So now we can just do the variation of L. Now we can just do the variation of L. Yeah, maybe I will keep that equation, then I will do this board first. Yeah. Can I show if like something in the symmetry of your um, action for the like, for your system? Um, yeah. would you like Directly vary the thing like parameter and then show that your action doesn't change, or would you do that um, like the infinitesimal form and then show that like? So, so we want to right. So we want to use the fact that such a trans uh, such a transformation is a symmetry to derive what is the constraint uh, uh, on the Lagrangian. Okay, uh, uh, what is the constraint on the theory? Say we assume that somehow the, uh, uh, the theory have a symmetry, and then we want to see what is uh, uh, what is the constraint this put on your uh, 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 theory. Yeah, that's right. We are proving the laws of theory. Yeah. Good. Other questions? Okay, so that equation. Is the uh, 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 is the implication uh, uh, is the constraint imposed by the symmetry, and we want to see what this equation tells us. Okay. And for this purpose, we just do the variation. So the delta hat L. So because L is just a function of, uh, of phi, and then we have partial L, partial phi a, delta hat phi a, and then we have L partial partial mu by A and then partial mu delta hat by A. Okay? So we just did the variation. And now, okay, uh, and uh, 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 so yeah. And now we are going to use the equation motion. Okay, so, so from the equation motion, I think I erased. Yeah, from the equation motion, then partial L, partial phi A, this is just equal to partial mu, partial L, partial, partial mu phi A. Okay? So we just plug in uh, uh, this into here. So when you plug in this into here, now you notice this becomes a total derivative. Okay, so you have partial L, partial 
attribute by a insert a hat by a. Okay, so you find that after using the equation motion, this variation of L have the following form, which is the total derivative. And this should be equal to the right hand side, okay? Uh, should be equal to the right hand side. Yeah, so, so uh, um, yeah, so, and then we, here we find, so this should be equal to epsilon, plus mu k mu. Okay, so we combine both sides together, plug in that this is equal to epsilon times fa, and then we conclude, okay, then we conclude partial mu, partial l, partial partial mu phi a, then fa minus k mu, racing equal to zero, okay? So if we call this j mu, and then we have a conservation equation, partial mu, j mu equal to zero. Okay, so we have a conservation law. So, so remember, a conservation law is just to, to have a vector which satisfies this equation, and, uh, and then, uh, um, So, so more explicitly, yeah, so the JMU is just this combination, okay? JMU is just this combination. So any questions on this? Yes? Is this like quite a strict condition because it's that the derivative with respect to space time is zero, but you can have a conservation law so the derivative with respect to time being zero, but not space time. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, I will, yeah, yeah, this is the stronger version than your normally yeah, uh, so this is the space-time version of the conservation law from your normally the classical mechanics. Yeah, so this is a field theory version of that. Yeah, yeah, uh, 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 I will elaborate that equation a little bit. Yeah. Yes. So, um, if you only transform the, the field, not the, 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 the x and t, right? yeah, the effect is. Uh, 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 say it again. I mean, uh, the, the reason that you include the derivative of the field is because you are including the effect of transforming the space time uh, coordinates. So, so here, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So here is a general formulation. Uh, 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 so this transformation can be general. Doesn't have to be, say, a, a, a space time transformation we said earlier. Uh, uh, this is just uh, some abstract uh, symmetry. Just some arbit uh, 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 arbitrary transformations. Yeah, because because space time variable is a dummy variable. In the action, you can always uh, uh, get rid of that. Uh, the x change uh, x is just a dummy variable in your in your action, because you, you because you integrate over uh, uh, over x. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That uh, that can include the uh, normally. Uh, uh, yeah, you can you, you can in principle have a, a, as many derivatives as you want, but normally we uh, uh, if we have an action which only contain first derivatives and your uh, your symmetry transformation only involve first derivatives. Um, yeah, yeah, in principle, you can have it. You can, in principle, you can have it. Just, uh, uh, yeah, I'm just writing this for simplicity. Yeah, yeah good. Maybe you can ask after the class. Uh, yeah, if it's not clear. Other questions? Okay, good. So, so let me uh, elaborate a little bit on this equation. So this equation you may have seen in the in E and M, so, uh, uh, which you often call the continu uh, continuity equation. Uh, if you write this equation separately, it has the following form, partial zero, j zero, plus partial i, 
or, or the uh, divergence of the spatial component. So J mu, if we write it in terms of the okay uh, uh, explicitly, then you have this form. So so this is so called the uh, continuity equation, just the the uh, uh, the time variation of the density. Okay, the zero component they consider some kind of density. It's the same as the divergence of the current. Okay. And in particular, you can define a charge, which is the total spatial integration of J0. Okay, so if you integrate the both sides by uh, 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 over the total volume, and then this just becomes partial zero Q, and this term becomes a total derivative, and, uh, and then you can convert it into a boundary term using the Gauss law, and uh, and then normally the uh, current vanishes at infinity, and then you just have the charge conversation. Just have charge conversation. Okay. And uh, um, yeah. So so this is like the field. So normally in classical mechanics, you just have this equation. Okay. And this is the field theory version of your conservation law. Yes. Sorry? Is there a way to calculate what J represents? Uh, uh, J, uh, J represents? Yeah, what it represents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If I give you a specific, yeah, you will do it in your PSAT. So if I give you a specific Lagrangian, if you start a specific transformation, and then you will be able to find all those quantities, uh, you will be able to find the K explicitly, and you will be able to find all those quantities explicitly, then you can find the J. Other questions? Yes. Right. It's because the because if we have here, so if we here if we have delta s equal to zero, and then and then you can just uh, put the delta in, and then this quantity uh, uh, then is integrated over that. It, uh, if this is zero, then this has to be a total derivative. Other questions? Yes? It's not a global symmetry, and this is argument Right, yeah, good, good, good. This is a very uh, uh, um, good question. So, so, yeah, so I will not have time uh, to go into here. Uh, uh, let me just very quickly mention so this is called the first Lossa theorem, and uh, 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 when epsilon is space-time independent, and so so when epsilon is not space-time dependent, and then the story is a little bit more complicated. So the epsilon will be inside, so the epsilon will be inside this uh, uh, total derivative. You cannot take it out, etc. And then the story changes a little bit, and then and then there's something called the second Lossa theorem. And actually, in that case, when you have local symmetries, when epsilon depends on space-time, instead of finding conservation laws, you find that the, uh, your equation motion, not all, uh, uh, you find some part of the equation motion uh, are redundant. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, and if you, uh, it's not difficult, but I actually, uh, 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 in principle, I can put it in the P-side problem. Uh, <laughs> if people really want to see it. Yes? about the transformation of the vicinity of issuing the identity, what happens to the transformation of the transformation outside? Good, good, good. So, so this is the QBT, a Q key beauty of uh, physics, which you may already ha have seen in quantum mechanics. So whenever we see a symmetry, no matter how complicated that symmetry is, say, say some continuous symmetry, it's enough just to understand that symmetry near the identity, near the, uh, to be the infinitesimal transformation. It's because any finite transformation you can build up from, from just adding up the infinitesimal transformations. So once you know the infinitesimal transformation actually essentially uh, up to some global uh, topological structure essentially de uh, determine the full finite transformation. Uh, no, then it's always a symmetry, right? Be because be 
because each step is a symmetry, and so you add them up, uh, you add them up, still a symmetry. Oh, or if you do different, yeah, uh, they're, uh, they're still uh, a symmetry. Yeah, because by definition, uh, uh, if something that, uh, something transform is invariant, you do a lot of transformation, it's still invariant. Good, other questions? Yes. Sorry? For discrete symmetries. For discrete symmetry. Uh, yeah, in general, for discrete symmetries, you don't have uh, uh, such a conservation law. Uh, you don't have such a conservation law. Uh, you can still, sometimes you can still dis uh, define some discrete quantum number, which is conserved, like the parity, which in the parity case, and uh, uh, but, but you don't have a current. Okay, so here, uh, uh, JMU is called the conserved current. So, uh, uh, but you won't have a current. Good, good. So, so this concludes our discussion, very quick discussion of the important features of classical field theory. And with this preparation, and now we can start talking about uh, uh, start thinking about uh, going to quantum mechanics, talking about the quantum field, okay? And so, so here is a good place to pause a little bit from what we said, uh, uh, from what we already said about the classical field theory to, to anticipate a little bit about the uh, uh, quantum field theory, okay? So, so here I will restate our goal for uh, uh, for uh, uh, for quantum field theory, which I said a little bit in the in the last lecture, okay. So now we have seen the classical fields, and our goal is to understand the quantum version of this story, okay. So so classical field theory is the classical mechanics with infinite number of degrees freedom. And now we want to quantize this infinite number degrees freedom, and now this becomes quantum field theory. Okay, and now we want to understand the quantum dynamics of such a field, uh, uh, such kind of five fields. Okay, and uh, for example, uh, uh, example is the E and M. You have electric magnetic fields. Okay, and uh, uh, you know the Maxwell equations. You can solve the Maxwell equations, and uh, so that defines the classical field theory, and. Uh, and then, then we will tell you how to actually quantize such a system to understand the electric field and the magnetic field uh, quantum mechanical. Good, and, uh, and that actually would be the, uh, our goal. Okay, so we will start the simplest field theory, just the scalar field theory, and then we go to the uh, Dirac theory, which describes the electron, and then eventually we will go to the theory which describe the electromagnetic field, but this is called the QED, okay, uh, quantum electrodynamics. So that will be the end point of, uh, of this course. Um, okay, so, so now, let's say a little bit how we go to this classical field theory to, to quantum field theory, okay? So, so some, just gen some general remarks. So before doing that, let's think a little bit how we go to from classical mechanics with a small number of degrees freedom, how, how you go to quantum mechanics, okay. So, um, so, so let's recall. So in classical mechanics, so let's just consider the simplest case, you just have a single degree freedom, say xt, Okay, just one dimensional particle whose motion just describes the xt. And, then, and then, then, of course, the goal of classical mechanics is just to solve the equation motion over xt. Okay? So if I write down the equation for xt and I solve it, then I'm done. Okay, I'm done. Uh, 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 you solve the classical mechanics. So when we go to quantum mechanics, What do you do? 
So this xt then become an operator. OK, so become an operator. So the a classical dynamical variable now become a quantum operator. And the equation motion of xt, if you remember, then do you remember what it becomes? Uh, uh, yeah, it actually becomes the Heisenberg equation. So become the Heisenberg equation for xt, uh, for, uh, for this operate xt now. OK. Uh, uh, yeah. So, so in quantum mechanics, there are two, no, normally two ways to describe it. So first is the Schrodinger picture. In this case, you have a wave uh, uh, you have a wave function, uh, which is a function of x and t, and then you have an operator, which is x. Okay, and then of course you also have conjugate momentum, etc., uh, uh, which is defined to be say x dot. Okay, and so so the wave function is a function of the eigenvalues of so x here should be understood as eigenvalues of this operator x hat. OK? Uh, 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 it's the eigenvalue of uh, uh, x hat. So in the Schrodinger picture, you solve the evolution for, for psi. You solve the equation for psi. And once you find psi, then you can calculate any quantities you want. OK, you can calculate any uh, uh, expectation values, uh, uh, any uh, uh, amplitude, et cetera. But the second way of approaching it is the Heisenberg picture. In, in this case, you the, the dynamical quantity is your operator. Now you assume the operator depends on time. So in the Schrodinger picture, your x is just some constant uh, operator does not depend on time. But in the Heisenberg picture, now, now, now your operator now become time dependent. Okay, and the equation motion, and, and you solve the Heisenberg equation, okay, and then the state is invariant. Okay, state does not evolve with time. Okay, so, so you solve the Heisenberg equation for those operators, and once you solve the Heisenberg equation, and then you can evaluate, again, your, your expectation value in any states you are interested in, etc. So any questions on this? So this is a very quick review of what you did to go from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. OK. So now in field theory, OK, in, in field theory, we do the same, uh, similar thing. So similarly, in field theory, we have cl classical fields. OK, we have classical fields. And then when you go to quantum, this become quantum operators. OK, so this is now quantum operators. Remember, in field theory, this x is always just labels of the space point. OK, uh, it's not a dynamic variable. OK, uh, the rotation is a little bit uh, 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 yeah, here the, uh, uh, in classical mechanics, this is dynamic variable. But in field theory, this is just labels. Okay, so uh, so they are not dynamic. A dynamic variable are phi itself. So so phi become an operator. Okay, and then now the classical equation of motion for of phi, which we derived, and then become the Heisenberg equation. Phi hat, okay, for phi hat. So, so again, here you can do two picture. You can do the Schrodinger picture. You can do a Heisenberg picture. So, so for QFT, the Schrodinger picture. Again, you look at the wave functions of your dynamical variables. 
the eigenvalue of dynamical variables. So, so what's the generalization of this psi xt? So remember here, psi is a function of eigenvalue of your dynamical variables, OK? So now if we push this analog further, when you go to quantum field theory, in the Schrodinger picture, now the wave function should be a function of phi x and the t. Okay, so this phi x are eigenvalues of phi hat x. Okay, so, so in the Schrodinger picture, phi hat does not evolve with time. And, uh, and so you have the wave function, which is uh, 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 the function that uh, 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 now become a functional a bit. Because this itself is a function of space, okay? And uh, 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 yeah. And then you solve the Schrodinger equation for this, and then you have the uh, uh, the operator, and then you have the operator, yeah. And so you have uh, uh, and the dynamic, uh, and then you have operator phi x. Okay, so so that's what you do in the Schrodinger picture. In the Schrodinger picture. And in the Heisenberg picture, if you forget about the wave function, okay? You look at the evolution of operators. So, so the Heisenberg for the field theory the Heisenberg picture for the field theory is that you look at the evolution of x and t so now this just obeys the Heisenberg equations which is just is the classic uh, just the quantum version of the classical equation for phi so you have the Heis uh, uh, you look at the evolution of this and then the state does not change with time okay uh, the state does not change with time. Good, any questions on this? Yes. Yeah. So in the Schrodinger picture, so remember the x, x is a label of for phi, but time is, is evolution. But in the Schrodinger picture, the operator don't evolve. And so there's no time here. So we don't have time here. And we just have the, uh, just the analog of the x here in the Schrodinger picture uh, for the, uh, for the uh, classical, yeah, yeah, for quantum mechanics. And then, and, then the, and then the time dependence is in your wave function. So the wave function is a function of possible values, eigenvalues of this uh, 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 operator phi now. Yeah. Okay? And uh, then the Heisenberg picture again, then you just focus on the operator equations. And once you solve the operator equations, and then, and then you can calculate the uh, say expectation values in any state you want. OK. So now you can already maybe see a difference a little bit. So if you do the Schrodinger picture, you have to deal with this beast, OK? Which is the wave functional of all possible values of some function in space, OK? And if you have multiple fields, then this is a hugely complicated thing. And you need to write down the Schrodinger equation for it, et cetera, OK? But here, but in the Heisenberg picture, we just solved the analog of the classical equation of motion, which we have already written down. And you just now interpret it as a quantum operator equation. So which one you think is simpler? So, so, so that's why in quantum field theory, we almost always use Heisenberg picture. Okay, we always use Heisenberg picture, and, uh, and we don't even uh, uh, rarely think about the, the wave function. Uh, it, it, even though sometimes uh, uh, this can be useful in, in some problems, but for the most of the time, this is much easier. Okay. So, so that's what we are going to do. Okay? And so in quantum field theory, we will 
just use the Heisenberg picture almost all the time. Okay. From now on, uh, I will not talk about the Schrodinger picture. Okay. Good. So, so it's very important you remind yourself about quantum mechanics in the Heisenberg picture. Okay. Uh, and because most of your quantum mechanical uh, 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 classes before, maybe it's all in the Schrodinger picture, solving the wave, uh, solving the Schrodinger equations, etc. But now you have to change the perspective to think everything uh, in terms of the Heisenberg picture. And then that will make you learning quantum field theory much easier. Okay? Good. Any questions on this? Yes? So if in the Heisenberg picture, if we're not concerned about the wave function and all, then how, how do we determine, like, for example, the probability or the expectation value of where x is at some point or the momentum? Good, good, good. That's a very good question. So, so this is actually also related to the kind of, kind of questions we want to solve in, uh, in quantum field theory. So in quantum field theory, we often work with the vacuum state. So, so for example, uh, uh, here, uh, 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 yeah, so when you can see the QED, most of the time, in the, in the quantum <coughs> electric magnetic field, they are in the vacuum state. And so, uh, so, uh, so we just consider the psi in the vacuum state. And so we don't have to consider, uh, 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 yeah. Yeah, it's a, uh, so normally in quantum field theory, they are, they are preferred states we are interested in. So it, uh, that's a lot of reason uh, 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 that the uh, uh, Heisenberg picture is convenient. Yeah. You don't have to consider general state in general. Yes? What is the physical meaning of the wave function in the state we are in? Hmm? Sorry? What is the physical meaning of uh, psi here? Oh, oh, this is just some state you are interested in. Still, you have a Hilbert space, but now you just don't. Uh, uh, when you study the evolution, you you only evolve operate, you don't evolve states. Yeah, that, so that's the difference between the Schrodinger and the uh, Heisenberg picture. But uh, for example, in uh, quantum mechanics, uh, you take the expectation value of some operators with, with respect to the state, and we get like like measurement results and stuff. So what about uh, here? Uh, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, uh, 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 at this level, there's no difference between quantum field theory and the uh, quantum mechanics. Yeah, just uh, think about quantum mechanics in terms of Heisenberg picture. Translate everything you learned about the Schrodinger evolution, etc., in terms of Heisenberg picture. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So. Yeah, so uh, 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 it's, uh, it's uh, uh, again, so yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, what I should have said is that what uh, the state we are interested in are states which are close to the vacuum state. So, so, so you excite the vacuum a little bit. And uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's not, yeah, of course in the vacuum you don't have anything. And uh, we are since close to the vacuum state. Yeah, and later when we discuss things you will see. Yeah. Good, good, okay. So before going to quantum field theory, let's also make some remarks, have a short discussion on relativistic quantum mechanics, okay? So, so naively, if you have special relativity, plus quantum mechanics, so if you want to generalize, so most of the quantum mechanics you learned is the non-relativistic quantum mechanics, okay? But now if you want to incorporate special, we want to combine the special relativity with quantum mechanics. And then what should you get? What do you think you should get? Hmm? 
Hmm? I expect, yeah, just, just whatever comes to your mind. Hmm? <laughs> that's the right answer. <laughs> and that's the correct answer. But, but I was hoping some of you will say it's right basic quantum mechanics. <laughs> okay. So naively, when you combine these two, in particular, if you read some old uh, quantum mechanics books, they do discuss, uh, uh, they do discuss relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay, uh, so naively, that's what you get. Okay, when you combine these two, and you say, oh, we just get relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay, but that's actually not a correct statement. Actually, right, strictly speaking, the reason now you don't actually learn much about the relativistic quantum mechanics because, strictly speaking, relativistic quantum mechanics does not exist, okay? And whenever, if you want to combine quantum mechanics with special relativity, actually you get the quantum field theory. So the quantum field theory is actually forced on us if you want to unify special relativity and the quantum mechanics, okay? Uh, and even, even if you don't want to talk about the fields, okay? Uh, even if you don't want to talk about fields, if you just want to talk about the particles, Still, if you want to uh, unify these two, then you actually automatically lead to quantum field theory. So now let me just explain uh, uh, why this is the case, okay? Uh, 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 so that the, uh, you have some uh, better appreciation uh, of the quantum field theory. Good. So, so let's try to apply what you did for, for long relativistic quantum mechanics try to generalize it to, to derive some uh, relativistic quantum mechanics. Okay, suppose you are the, uh, the people in the 1926, okay? The quantum mechanics just was discovered, and you say, oh, people have understood non-relativistic quantum mechanics, now let's generalize to special relativity. Okay, so, so in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, how do we derive the Schrodinger equation? The way we do this is we start with your dispersion relation, okay, for a long relativistic particle. And then we say this take E to I partial T, okay, P. So say if you can have a vector become, yeah, so let me forget about H bar. Just, uh, P then becomes spatial derivatives, and then this equation just becomes the uh, Schrodinger equation for the free particles. Okay, so this becomes the Schrodinger equation for, for free long relativistic particles, then you can add the potentials, etc. Okay, so that's how you derive your Schrodinger equation for long relativistic quantum mechanics. So, but if you are someone, say, uh, in the early days of quantum mechanics, say, now let's try to generalize it to, to special relativity, and then it's easy to do, then in the relativistic case, then you have, you just start with the relativistic uh, dispersion relation. Okay, you say, let's do the same thing. Okay, let's do the same thing. So this become I partial T, and this P become uh, uh, this one, and then, uh, and then we can just write this equation. Okay? So now let's combine these derivatives together, uh, or put all this on the same side, and then what you find is partial mu, partial mu. Okay, that's what you get. So does this equation look familiar? Okay, so this is the simplest scalar field theory <laughs> equation motion we have written down. But here, the interpretation is very different, okay? So earlier, we wrote down this equation. We, uh, we say this is Klein-Golden equation. 
And this is the klein golden equation. Okay, so this is the equation working for the simplest free field, scalar fields that we wrote down before. But here, the interpretation is very different. So remember, the psi is not a field. In quantum mechanics, it's a wave function for a single particle sitting. Uh, so, so the psi is the amplitude for a particle at spatial location x at time t. Okay, so this is, and it's square, then it's its probability, okay? And this does not describe a field, okay? This is the wave function of a single particle, okay? Even though they have the same uh, uh, equation as the field theory we, uh, 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 we wrote down earlier. And uh, 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 so, the, so that's what Klein Gordon did, okay? So the Klein Gordon, they tried to generalize non relativistic quantum mechanics. Right, if it's quantum mechanics, then they wrote down this equation. They say, ah, oh, now we are immortal, okay? Because we wrote down the, <laughs> the first equation for, 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 for relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, then, then soon realized, so soon realized actually this equation, if you want to interpret it as a right equation for the wave function, there are actually lots of problems. There are various problems. Uh, yeah, by, by saying lots of it, maybe it's a little bit exaggeration there. Uh, there are various problems. So, um, yeah, so, so some, yeah, let me call this equation. I think I have used up my, my, uh, uh, my stars. I think to have a four star is a little bit too, too much. Let's just call this equation one uh, for this section. So, so some immediate difficulties. Of interpreting one as a wave equation, okay? As a wave equation for relativistic particle. Yeah, let me just save time. Okay, so so this is the wave function for long relativistic particle. If you want to generalize to quantum mechanics, a relativistic quantum mechanics, then you would interpret this as a wave equation for 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 a single relativistic particle. Okay. So um, so first, so first is that, so if you remember, so in this equation, okay, for, uh, 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 if you go back to your early days uh, uh, of this uh, 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 long relativistic quantum mechanics, so you remember from this equation you can, de uh, you can derive a equation for the conserved probability, okay? A uh, conserved probability, and, the, and that equation tells you that psi square should have the interpretation of the probability, okay? So, but, but for, uh, uh, for that equation, you can show there's no quantity has, can be, there's no quantity can be used as probability density. Okay, so probability density by, by definition should satisfy two conditions. So the first condition is that it's non-negative. And the second uh, condition is that it should be conserved. Okay, the probability should be conserved, otherwise you violate the, uh, uh, um, yeah. So, so you can show that this equation actually does not allow, uh, 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 this equation allows such a quantity, but this equation does not allow. Okay, uh, and I uh, will not go through that 
myself, I think that will be in your PSI2, okay? Uh, that will be in your PSI2, you will show it yourself. And the second difficulty is that if you square that, uh, if you find the energy, so the energy, if you take the square root, then the energy in principle can be, say, plus minus, yeah, you have two solutions. Okay, yeah, E equal to plus minus uh, uh, this quantity. So, in contrast to that equation, there's only positive energy. Okay, uh, long relativity just have positive energy. So classically, you can just say let's throw away the second branch. Okay, uh, 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 we can just throw away the second branch by hand. Okay, classically, but quantum mechanically. Okay, so classically. Just ignore the second branch. Uh, the lactyl branch. Okay, but but quantum mechanically this is not possible. Okay, because you have the equation there, then you automatically have the lactyl solutions. Okay, so so quantum mechanically, and then you have dispersion relation like this. So that dispersion relation have uh, the following form is say E as a function of P. Okay, so you have a positive branch, then you have a lactyl branch. And then you remember in quantum mechanics, you can have the, uh, uh, then you have energy levels, and you have energy levels. And the such particle, uh, then a particle here, that have a higher energy than particle here, okay? Uh, and so, uh, so uh, here the energy level is higher than energy level here. And there's always a, a long zero probability quantum mechanically for a particle to, to go from some higher uh, energy level to the lower energy level. Okay, just like in the hydrogen atom, if you excite it, and the, they always uh, uh, go to the lower energy, uh, energy level. So in quantum mechanically, such thing cannot be avoided. Okay, so you cannot just throw this branch away. Okay, and so and so this will lead to instability. Because the because the uh, uh, big, because the energy can be infinitely negative. Okay, can be infinitely negative. And then, and then all your particles uh, will all go to infinite lactive energies, and then, uh, then your system will be uh, uh, in big problem. Okay. So, so these are the two. So these are the two. Uh, um, uh, 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 the uh, uh, the most prominent problems, and then people uh, tried many different ways. Try to avoid them, etc., including some very ingenious solutions, etc. So we will not go into them. But let me just mention this: actually, even if you can address those problems, still the uh, the the relativistic quantum mechanics will not make sense for a very fundamental reason. Okay, so so these are the more like superficial reason why why that equation does not quite work. Okay, but there's actually more fundamental reason. Why? Right? Why uh, uh, relativistic quantum mechanics, even as a concept, does not make sense? Okay. So, so by definition, by definition, if you want to interpret this kind of thing as a wave function, okay. So, what's the interpretation of the wave function, which we already said? So, this is the uh, describe the amplitude for single particle at some point, okay. Uh, 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 at some point x uh, 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 at time t. But now if you have two particles, what do you do? You introduce the location for particle one and the particle two and the t. Okay, so this describes two particles. And if you want to describe three particles, then you have to introduce more x. Okay, remember that's what you did in non relativistic quantum mechanics. So in non relativistic quantum mechanics, this makes sense. Okay, you can just because there's no mixing between the different uh, 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 branches, say single particle, two particles, because particle cannot be created and destroyed in uh, a long relativistic system. But in relativistic system, you can always create particles. Okay, if you have enough uh, energy, you can create new particles, uh, pair create electrons, 
okay, happens in the accelerator all the time, all electrons they, they can annihilate into photons, okay. So so uh, so uh, so the particles are not conserved, okay, not conserved. So so this kind of wave function concept don't even make sense. So if you want to describe, so that means whenever you have special relativity and the quantum mechanics together, you must have a framework which can describe arbitrary number of particles at the same time, okay? Because particle numbers can change all the time, okay? Because of annihilation and the creation effect. And that cannot be achieved by, by this kind of concept like wave function, okay? It cannot be achieved by wave function. It turns out, miraculously, that can be achieved by field theory. It turns out the field theory, once you quantize it, automatically give you a framework to describe arbitrary number of particles, okay, in the in the unified manner, okay, single particle, two particles, arbitrary number of particles, and so this is one of the magic of field theory. Uh, so that's why uh, the field theory plays such important role in particle physics. It's because the uh, excitations of fields uh, automatically provide the mechanism to describe arbitrary number of particles. Okay, so we will stop here today. <laughs>